In the meantime, I just want to say hello uh, from the Vivi House side. We're currently in the Vivi House, we just erected it um, some weeks ago. I want to introduce this. Who are you? I'm Paul. Paul. Mika. Uh, I'm Nicholas. Nicholas, okay. Yeah. Hello. We are, we are now in a building um, without um, any light, and it's getting dark, so soon only the screen will uh, give some light to the room. <laughs> so that you know. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, that's a second prototype of the build? Of your... Yes, it's, it's, it's exactly. It's consisting of... Oh, sorry, you're, you're, uh, you got muted for a second there. It's consisting of the first prototype and the second one, so the first one is integrated. We disassembled the first one and it's out, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. I, I hand over to, to Nicholas. Uh, can, can you make a, a short introduction about uh, uh, the, the Video House project and, and your team? Yes, of course, but probably it's the easiest. I, I just walk around very quickly around mm. the building yeah. and so you can see some things. And, um, because this daylight is also getting... Uh, God, right, right? Daylight is getting... Um, yeah. So oh. you're in the actual prototype right there. Exactly, yeah. Now, mm. yeah, this is like the... floor room. And I'm going outside first and then go around the building. Nice. You are all at the university? Yes, we, we've uh, been at the technical university and now the project is ending. And I have to go away a little. We're now in Vienna. This is a, a, mm. let's say a, a urban development area. Mm -hmm. And you can see in the background. Oh, wow. Basically, this three-story building. It's um, hmm. conceived actually for six stories, and wow. we now made a, a three-story prototype. Hmm. Is it just caught us in our um, in our moment of uh, when I was broke moment? You know. Is, say it, say it again. Ted video. Your your what moment? You said once in your first um, TED video you said, and soon I was broke. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I, I, I guess those moments uh, come repeatedly in life. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nice. But that's pretty impressive that you're now building up to the third floor even, which is m more than two. Three is starting getting to be pretty impressive. You can imagine like each of those like facade elements, they're a little bit like a square. Uh -huh. They are all of them have been created like in a DIY, do it together uh, fashion. Yeah. All the parts you can see have been made it, uh, on with people who didn't have any craftsmanship experience. And only the assembly of all the building parts be created uh, with professionals. Those guys who were using a crane and yeah. Is, is that what you intend to do, that the panels are manufacturable DIY, but then you have professional installation? Let's say at the beginning, we were um, I was thinking a lot about what is safe to do. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was a big question about, okay, six stories, how do we do that? Of course, uh, prefabrication is it's very important, it's very safe. And... And we not yet have figured out how to make assembly with a crane in a DIY manner. You know. This right. is something we have um, spared out for now. Could mm -hmm. be something for the future, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the moment, it's just, yeah. What's okay. the current kind of cost structure that you're aiming for? Do you have any ideas at this point? Or, yes, or tell me yes. what's, what, t tell us more. Tell the world. <laughs> Let's say, um, I mean, uh, there are some costs uh, that are, let's say, we, we would love to aim for, but because in Vienna you have, uh, if you get below certain uh, costs per square meter, you get a lot of funding. 
Mm. It's called like it's related to social housing that we have here. Mm-hmm. This what used to be an aim. We're now probably not gonna make it so easily. We don't know yet. Um, mm-hmm. Because if you use this technology you, and you build six stories and you make a let's say a big block, then it's very cheap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you make a prototype, it costs at least twice as much um, okay. as square meter. So for, we are ranging from 1,500, it's the cheapest we can hope for, uh, uh, 1,500 euros per square meter. And what the smaller it gets, it can start from 3,000 euros per square meter. But mm-hmm. what those buildings can do is they fulfill all the, the local standards and they're very energy efficient and, and you know, so it's easy to make a passive house from it it's, um, yes I'm going inside I guess now. okay uh, that's pretty impressive that's that's good good work there um, is that has that all been funded by the university or has other partners no or? no it's been um, a mix a pretty big mix of that was I, I mean, I mean can you actually go upstairs? Can you show upstairs? Does, go upstairs it have, yes. does it have stairs? I, I just want to mention all those walls are clay plaster walls. Clay plaster, yeah. Yeah, yeah. behind them you have strawberries. Mm-hmm. And what it costs, um, those diagonals are necessary to make it stable for six stories. Yeah. And it's also lasting 90 minutes in, in case of fire. Mm-hmm. That's laminated. That's what, Engineered yeah. lumber. Exactly. So now I'm in this first floor, I'm just rotating a bit. We're looking around. Mm-hmm. We, we, what we did is it's very simple. You see the columns, uh-huh. and you see holes in the columns as well. Uh huh. Right. And this is where we screw into our facade elements. So mm-hmm. this is how they are mounted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So basically, we have these wooden frames. And almost like the door of a car, we screw those elements onto this fr- framework. How are you addressing the boundaries? Like what's what's in between for air tightness and water tightness between the panels? Because that's an issue we deal with. Exactly, it's a big issue. <laughs> Do you have a solution for that um, yes. yet or no? Yes, we have worked with one and we're not satisfied with it. It's uh, called Compriband. It's like a pre Com- compressed uh, rubber band that mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. that goes up, uh, yeah expands slowly once you use it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Okay. And, the... and now we have this one staircase here, but we only made one. And for the third floor up here, you have to use a ladder. Yeah, you ran out of budget there for for stairways, exactly. huh? Exactly. Understand. We need a lot of square meters <laughs> for staircases. So. Yeah. What's the in a five fifteen hundred euro per square meter cost? What's the majority of that cost? Can you break it down for it for us? I will ask my colleague who knows a bit more about it. One second. Is it about is it about fifty percent labor or is that all just materials? So now he's our financial expert. All right, Mika. Um, uh, hi. Um, you have to dis- you have to distinguish between um, the DIY workshop labor and all the labor that is included in other materials that have been produced by professionals. So, at the end, all is labor, no? as, we, as we all know. But uh, so you think like seventy five percent labor? No, I mean hundred percent labor. But in the DIY workshop, um, we made probably we used probably thirty uh, percent compared to what the whole building costed. We, we estimated that it's about up to thirty percent. Herr Mesh, kannst du nichts hören? Yeah? We estimated that up to thirty percent of the labor we can um, we can bring in by 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 DIY labor. But of course, when you when you look at uh, the, at the uh, what's it laminated uh, veneer lumber, as you just saw it uh, in the building, uh, then of course 
everything's labor, no? Somebody's chopping it in the wood, somebody, and you know all these processes. So the question is, where do we cut the process of uh, professional labor or, or, or standard uh, capitalist input labor and DIY workshop labor? And what, uh, of course, this, this boundary or these margins are quite flexible. So what is, um, in terms of the materials that you bought, like, so you have straw, you have engineered lumber, you've got, what else? I mean, what are what are you buying well, say, right now? Let's say, I would say the biggest cost factor is the laminated wood. Everything mm -hmm. that would be used was the biggest. The second biggest. No, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say no. that. Right, let's say the whole building. You said now, uh, um, up till now we had three hundred thousand euros, I think, for materials and also service, like service that we had to buy in, and the lumber was about ten percent of that. Okay. The, the windows were about 10% of that. And all the rest of it is just a lot of different materials you also need for building. Um, let's say uh, the insulation material, which is volume-wise quite a big amount, was really, really cheap because the straw bale is about one to two euros. So it's about four euros for a square meter, for a square meter wall. Uh, if you want to buy it as a Certif certificated um, billing material. There's also um, billing straw bale as an official certificated material. Oh. It's already twice or three times the amount of the, of the material costs, just because somebody had to check it and say it's proof uh, that you can build with it. Of course, if you have a little bit of experience uh, when you have built many times with that material, you can see it yourself that it's the right bale, and you could you could officially bring into the building and to save a lot of costs <laughs> but like that it, it's probably with, with all materials that we surround ourselves with mm -hmm. Does this answer the question a little bit yeah so and do you do you have a detailed budget I mean you've kept notes obviously did you publish that yet or is that internal documents we haven't published anything yet of this building. Uh, can you send that to me? We can send uh, whatever we will produce. I think we will need one or two more months to, to get everything done firmly and uh, so that it's not a rough estimate that we send out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when you guys think but about... The, yeah, go ahead. The, the prices for the prototype, of course, will be uh, completely different to um, if you would have a huge building of six story like housing and office mixed building mm -hmm. okay he already mm -hmm. told you okay and have but you haven't shown the six story no. No. okay yeah yeah okay. good job um what else do you have so you've got insulation you've got floor you've got the beams. in terms of uh, the whole percentage of building materials again yeah I'm just curious, in this prototype, what systems have you included? You've got windows, you've got floors. What is the floor? Mm, the floor is actually also insulated with straw bales because we have we have one in between ceiling, between two floors, but actually the lower and the top ceilings are the outer shell of the building, so they have to, to support the climate design. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, a, a HVAC, HVAC system that comes from uh, the PV panels and an electric electricity heating. So that's low, already on the building. Low voltage heating, not yet, no. And we have um, uh, ventilation system that with heat recovery, with heat recovery which requires which which requires um, an airproof building. So that makes it actually much more difficult to seal it to seal all the elements. Uh, and, and it provokes a lot of problems in modern building, as, as you probably know. Um, we actually thought that using clay is not also an eco-friendly material. It could also solve a lot of problems when it comes to humidity uh, in inside walls, inside but all these problems that, that come along with sealing a building. Are you going to use clay in the final models, or what will you do? Plaster? We'd like to, yeah. It's actually the same material costs as cement plaster, I think. 
It's just uh, the, the labor that is more expensive because we need two or three layers to, to get it airtight and make nice surfaces. But of course, I mean, we can talk about that later. In your, in your current budget of 300,000 euros, what of that was bought materials? Mm. versus I'm, equipment I'm, or labor? It's actually... It's all, all of that actually went to buying materials or buying services like transportation or um, what else? buying the labor of somebody who is, who is doing the, the, the metal planes on the outside, for example. Um, and then we got about a hundred students that work for, let's, let's estimate the working time, those students, and then we could, then we could compare it to the, to the costs we spend on materials. Hundred students, uh, well, that's not counted in the 300,000? No, no, no. It's, mm -hmm. I thought, we made rough calculations in the beginning of the project and it was about 30%, up, up to 30% maximum that this labor could, could be calculated with. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so yeah. sorry very much. Uh, I'm back again. Uh, I lost my second monitor during the screen sharing, so <laughs> uh, I try to keep up. Uh, uh, Ramesh, uh, is your sound working now? I you are muted. I must unmute. He had the microphone off. Unmute yeah. your microphone. You have yeah. to unmute it locally on your phone. You have to press a button to unmute your phone. I, I, I see your phone, your microphone is, un, is muted. I can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> so uh, I make a short introduction to uh, Ramesh. Mm -hmm. He is an architect and a city planner. Uh, I hand over to you. Can you say some sentences? No, you are muted now again. I came in too late, so I'd like to listen for a while first. Uh, okay. So I, I'm afraid to lose my monitor again. So. Nicholas, uh, maybe you can make the screen sharing. You you have the, the link uh, with the Miro board. Could okay. you try to to make a screen sharing? Yes. There, there is a presentation mode uh, in in the Miro board. It's on on the bottom left side. Well, I have to look for it first. One, one second. Yeah. Okay. So in the in the meantime, uh, I, I try to to talk a little bit about uh, open source uh, hardware. As you might know, the 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 Dean spec for which tries to clarify the situation on open source hardware uh, is official now. And uh, uh, there are three levels uh, on, on the standards. One is the national standard level, which is the DIN, which is, is the German Okay, great. Now we are there. And on the on the bottom left, uh, the second icon is the presentation mode. No, go to the left on the bottom. Das ist ein Dreieck und dann schaut aus wie von YouTube, links unten ist. Ja, genau, das zweite. Ja, dieses da. Okay. Ja. 
Somebody is talking. Okay, now we have another participant. Somebody is talking. Okay, uh, Harald Gründel has arrived. Uh, uh, he is a designer. Uh, I, I hand over to Harald Gründel to say some some words to uh, to, to talk about what, what you are doing. Yeah, so we, 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 we're currently supporting the open source hardware community with, with, with some projects that we are working on. One is a mobility project that we also shared with Marshin a year ago, which we're still working on. And a very new development is that we created a social design enterprise from which we do all the open source hardware projects now. So, and as a second, as a second um, uh, hat that I'm wearing, I'm, I'm, I'm leading the Institute of Design Research Vienna, which is um, investigating future proof design strategies. And with me is Georg, and he's we're working together on design projects. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have several uh, very interesting open source hardware projects in Austria, uh, but uh, we, we decided to start with the, with the most complex project, projects which is architecture, because uh, Margin, you are working on, on, on architecture, on an architecture project and the Vivi House project is an architecture project, so our main topic today uh, will be uh, architecture. But before we start with, with uh, architectural questions, uh, I try to hook on the status about, uh, open, uh, about the standardization. And uh, as I mentioned, and uh, you, you might know, the, the Dean spec, which is a, a kind of preliminary stage of a standard, is official now. Uh, everybody can download it and we are very proud that it is uh, the first Dean spec, which is uh, under Creative Commons, so you don't have to pay for it. And uh, I, I had... Uh, I, I tried to discuss with Martin Heuer uh, some, some questions and maybe uh, Nicholas, if you can step downwards in the presentation to, to the next slide. Yes, great, okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, uh, three levels on, on standards. There is the national level, which is uh, the DEAN, the, the, the German standard uh, institution. And in Austria, there is Austrian standards. And there is a European level. And there is the ISO, the International Standard Organization. And of course, we don't want a German standard or an Austrian standard. and. We want to bring it on the international level, but uh, there, there is some work to do on that. So can you skip to the next slide? Yes, the uh, DEAN spec uh, 
is divided into two parts and the first part uh, describes all the operational definitions and the second part uh, describes a community-based uh, certification procedure and uh, there, there already is a bug in it because it shouldn't say certification uh, but uh, I will come to that uh, on the next slide. So, next slide. So, here are some questions which I came up uh, to Martin Neuer. He, is the, he was the project leader of, of the Dean Spec project. And uh, as he answered, the Dean Spec project uh, has ended now. Uh, and uh, all further activities are voluntary so there are no concrete uh, efforts for the, the next level to go to the ISO level but uh, you, you can find all the informations and the collection of questions and so on in GitLab to, you, you see the, the link here also there is no there, there, there has been a consortium, but uh, since the DeanSpec has finished, there is no consortium currently, but uh, there is a, a new consortium on, under planning. And there is some work going on uh, about uh, meta standard and uh, what is called TSDC, which stands for technology specific documentation criteria. And as we all know, uh, documentation is a very important uh, part. We are suffering under open source hardware. So, uh, as you might know, there are some other initiatives which have been before the Dean Spec. One uh, of them is OSHWA, the Open Source Hardware Association. And uh, another one is uh, OSI, the Open Source Initiative. And the Dean Spec is uh, based on all, uh, on, on these two initiatives, but it's enhancing is it and it brings some sort of uh, uh, legal uh, insurance. So, uh, the, the thing with the certification. Uh, the, op the, the Open Source Hardware Association uh, has, uh, like last year, the Open Source Hardware Month, which is in October. And this year, their topic is certification. And if you look on to under the homepage of the OSHWA, you find a list of uh, open source hardware certified projects. And I had a look on it and I found the Axiom project, which is an Austrian project, and it has been certified in 2016. But that's all I found. So I couldn't find anything about the certification project, which of course has been a peer review. And uh, yeah, that, that's all I found. So I I think that's, that's pretty worthless. And also as Martin Heuer said, uh, uh, it's not really, you, you, we shouldn't call it certification. Uh, the Dean Speck is working on uh, what they call attestation and uh, certification is very specific because certifications like ISO certifications uh, are very difficult, uh, are very expensive and so on. So uh, I would like to know from Martin 
how, how do you see this situation? Do, do you have any plans to certify some of your prototypes or projects uh, from open source ecology? Yeah, absolutely, of course. So we just haven't gotten around to it, to doing that. And there's just a lot of development happening. Like when we released, for example, the 3D printers, uh, I mentioned on the note that we're applying for that, but just didn't have the time to do that yet. Uh, but the answer is clearly yes, as we've got all the documentation. And if somebody wants to help us, I mean, if it's a collaborative effort to, to do that, help us and com collect all the documentation. Because right now we use the, the wiki as our primarily, primary repository with the version histories right on the wiki and then also using some GitLab and GitHub. But all, like for example, for the 3D printers, all the information is there, like for the house, the version one of the CD home, everything is online. So we could right now certify that if, if somebody wants to help, we just haven't gotten around to it yet. And uh, would, would you work with the Dean spec? Because uh, I, I was asking Oshwa, and uh, I got the impression mm -hmm. that uh, the Dean spec is not interesting for Oshwa, because they say it's a German thing and uh, they, they want to wait until it is uh, an international standard. Uh, I. If it's a standard that's defined at this point, I don't see why we cannot use it. I, I don't have anything against using a German standard for uh, as long as it's clearly defined. If you can say this follows this standard and, and then the paperwork has to be done, I guess, in the States for whatever our organizations here. And, and who would that be? I guess uh, ASME or I, I don't know who, who are the different bodies, um, but the one but it, it's very interesting in just setting a precedent, so, so build upon the DIN spec, DIN spec uh, as much as we can in this country. Now we've got other issues like, like a potential revolution coming up in this country, but that's another story. <laughs> okay. We might have to wait until January 21 until some of this is resolved after the new, new president comes, comes in. <laughs> yeah. So, so we just have to wait until November. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So we, we are also thinking about uh, participating in October. So maybe we can talk about some interesting projects. Do, do, do you have some special projects uh, from open source ecology in mind? No, I mean, right, right now, so our focus is on a big campaign. So for the, as you might have seen the video on the extreme enterprise, uh, the focus, our focus right now is to make that happen. So based on the, the prototyping work we've done with the CD Home, for us right now, it's time to really take that to a viable product. And that's what we're working on to get a very standardized model of a house that's, that uses the DIY labor model where you can essentially do thousand square feet, so about a hundred square meters. Two people can build that in one week for $50,000. That's the package we're aiming to offer. Now that's cheating a little bit because before that, there is the part where you prepare, you build all the modules ahead of time. And that will take estimate, uh, well, the idea is on a weekend, uh, each little module of of about 1.25 by 2.5 meters, that's four by eight feet. Uh, each of those modules, like say a wall module, for us it only takes like two hours to, to do that. Now we're just using standard off-the-shelf materials. But that makes it very easy for anybody to go to a hardware store from st standardized supply chains and get a, get a low-cost house. So we're trying to really break that barrier uh, if you know the concept of the iron triangle, good, fast, cheap, pick two. I think with open source, uh, open source collaboration, I think we can break that when the designer 
such as ourselves so we're designers builders users we integrate all those things and for that reason we gain insights that in a standard model of construction when you have the architect then you have the engineer then you have the builder then you have the user who are all different people you get a lot of inefficiencies from that so we're trying to integrate that to a low cost to the absolute minimum low cost package of a house and that's the current effort so we aim to launch that actually by january so uh in an immediate sense, like talking about September, October, we can start uh, getting some videos out there and getting getting the word out there. I haven't really publicized much about the Extreme Enterprise outside of talking about it briefly, say at the FabX Live and other videos that we publish, but, but haven't really made a push in publicity or any major announcement or a blog post on that, but we aim to do that pretty, pretty soon. And we're trying to really uh, focus on that as um, if, if there's something that could come out of that for the Open Hardware Month, I don't know, but I haven't really thought about that part, but just focusing on getting the product out after the years of testing. Uh, because part of that is also integrating the tractors and the 3D printers into that, that work. So tractors as in helical peer foundations. So that's doable with the open source tractor and we're actually devising an open source helical pile driver. So basically a very strong hydraulic motor that's even geared down but that will be available technology once we develop it for very low cost helical peer foundations. And then the 3D printing, our effort right now is to develop the high temperature version of the 3D printer and at large scale for which we'll be doing actually a HeroX crowdfunding campaign in, in 2021 or a crowd development campaign rather. But the idea there is right now 3D printing is extremely limited we don't really have the access to to filament making from recycled materials. A big problem in that is there is no high temperature printers that are open source right now. That's a major gap in the 3D printing world. Uh, we do have a what what we think will be a very low cost design that will work for a high temperature chamber, and we mean like 176 C for the build chamber. So everything is separated from it. But that would, that's the, the point of that is very important. Then you're actually able to print with all plastics. Polyethylene, polypropylene, the two most common. Uh, right now that's impossible. You can't print with those materials using normal printers. Uh, the, the, the standard um, open source printers. It's just not, not possible. Uh, so yes. if you enable the high temperature route, you can now take common plastics there your plastic trash bags everything you can talk about even mixed blended uh, bulk filament that you produce using open source machinery and that just does not exist so if we can do that and then we we actually aim to start printing the lumber plastic lumber or the whole four by eight foot panels for the cd call so that's basically uh, just a lot of product development right now, getting focused on getting that out the door as a viable thing that anyone can build at a very low cost. Uh, there, there are some 3D printers uh, using clay. Did you have a look into into that? Into in clay? Be yes, we building houses yes. with 3D printers with clay. Yeah, that's that's good. The but walls are pretty much limited to walls and lim you're limited to what you can do with it. So walls are not the major cost of a house. It's foundations, roofs, utilities. So the 3D printer for clay, yes, that's good. Uh, it's not a priority for us right now. We think there's much more uh, potential that comes from developing the plastic. Um, as, as in we're solving now, we're solving the housing issue and the plastic waste issue at the same time. So yes, we, we will get into the, the cementitious materials like clay and cement, but at present, I mean, that's not super exciting because walls are like 20% of the house. So it's not uh, a huge aspect of the building process, though in a, in a bigger package, yes, that's quite relevant. In, in your workshop, you mentioned... Yeah. Can I say something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ramesh, was it you? Who, who was it? Okay. In, 
in, in, in the meantime, I, I have another question. In, in your workshop, you mentioned an interesting project. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah okay. So, um, Marcin, uh, I, I, I really like your idea of, uh, you know, the, the sort of prosumer, there's a producer and consumer rolled into one, and which upsets the traditional structure of contractor, building, uh, builder, you know, uh, even, even the official, you know, agency which gives permissions or the architect. But what I'm dead against is your idea of building houses the world that this planet cannot afford to have billions of individual houses anymore that's the end of the planet we have to look at cluster at multi-story building at more uh, concentrated high density housing and mm -hmm. you can do that i mean we have done that with mud uh, what you call clay but it's not clay it's mud mud uh, construction in, in India, where we said uh, to do high-rise building, uh, I mean, mud has all these uh, advantages of uh, keeping the temperature cool without air conditioning and, and uh, repair, people who live there can repair it themselves. But when you go into high-rise buildings and there's a, a lot of rain, heavy rain and all this stuff. So to prevent any collapse, we came up with the idea of a hybrid where we say mm -hmm. the the skeleton is a concrete uh, frame structure and uh, uh, that even can be prefabricated. Uh, but all the walls and the floors and seatings and everything are, are made of clay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, that solves this problem. I mean, every material has, has its uh, limitations. But uh, to overcome the limitations of mud for high-rise building, this is the solution we came up with. And I don't think you need a whole lot of uh, uh, standards and uh, uh, approval for that because the structure, the, the skeleton structure is my normal standards. Okay, so it holds up in terms of an earthquake or heavy rain or whatever. So uh, the, all the infill walls and also exterior walls and the floors and ceilings with walls can be made out of mud. That's what I wanted to say. And mm -hmm. so we have to escape this idea and I'm dead against this idea of yours to build houses, to enable people to build little, 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 little houses, cabins. Uh, because the, the, you need a car to get there. You need uh, uh, infrastructure in terms of sewage, electricity. Who pays for all that? Uh, no. Uh, and then you're ruining the landscape as well. So if you're going to have 10 billion people in a few years' time, uh, uh, the world will collapse if everybody's building little, little houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, who was this speaking? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, uh, I, I would like to hook on on this uh, because I see it also. Uh, in the meantime, I see it also very critically. All these tiny houses, but uh, I think that's a, a good topic for for the Vivi House architects because uh, uh, they they are thinking a lot about. Uh, this, this structure and also about uh, uh, modularity, which, which is a topic in, 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 in for, for, for margin, but also for sustainability. Nicolas, can you say some words? Um, I can say some words. As I just want to, because Martin was asking who was speaking, it was a professor from Graz. His name is Ramesh. Um, and okay. <clears throat> yeah, um, uh, yeah, we can talk about modularity. We can talk about ec ecologic building. Um, let's say um, for us, uh, I want to say something about multi-story approach. To um, mm -hmm. we, we have chosen six-story as a limit for now. We because of local uh, building regulations. Um, if you want to go beyond six stories, you have to cover up and um, put uh, non-flammable uh, panels on all our uh, wooden surfaces and um, lateral surfaces. This is due to the local uh, regulations. Um, mm -hmm. Regarding uh, modularity, we, we made it, I would say, I mean, modularity is also a matter of scale, how, how um, 
how big are your modules <laughs> and mm -hmm. how uh, can you um, make your modules from uh, smaller modules and what we tried we made I think from our point of view uh, regarding the six story buildings quite small modules I think you know a column is quite small mm -hmm. a facade panel of three by three meters mm -hmm. is quite small uh, compared to the timber industry in Austria they because they usually look at um, transportation opportunities and uh, look at the um, truck and if it's 30 meters long then the panel will be 30 meters long mm -hmm. so uh, we've chosen I think quite small pieces so we have uh, lots of intersections between the pieces which I think is a challenge and uh, what we did also is we conceived the modularity in a way that we can merge elements so we can make them small but if we merge uh, some neighbors they could be uh, one element as well horizontally or even verti vertically and I think we are actually quite happy about the modularity how we conceived it because you can exchange a lot of things here without um, making compromise or without changing the base idea of uh, this modularity so we could have completely different ways of uh, creating our um, floors or facade elements it could be made from very different materials and um, this, this was the kind of flexibility we, we, we tried to integrate and and now after making this first prototype we see a lot of mis let's say little mistakes and uh, we the modularity we are happy with the modularity because we don't need to change it to uh, uh, repair those mistakes. Can you hear me? This is Ramesh uh, speaking. Uh, uh, the modularity is a very good idea. Um, uh, because it's um, in the scale, human scale, and uh, people can change a panel themselves and stuff. My, my basic question was about this. Sorry, I can't hear. I was asking to unmute him, but I cannot unmute. We 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 can't hear you now. In the meantime, I wanted to say to Martin that we could have a separate session about costs. Are yeah, we? let's follow up. I'd love to see how we can collaborate. What's what your roadmap is right now and how we get pump this through the extreme enterprise method of gaining collaborative, crowded, uh, collaboratively developed kind of a project to accelerate. Let's maybe there's some ideas there. Would be very interesting, yes. Can I yeah. can I can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. So uh, what I'm trying to say I mean the modularity is a very good idea because people can <laughs> change things as they wish but my main question was about the, uh, putting so much effort into the wrong model of building single family houses or like houses scattered all over the landscape and suburb uh, american suburb the worst uh, worst uh, uh, habitat model that has ever been conceived uh, most wa most wasteful most socially isolating most environmentally destructive model of single houses Mm -hmm. You cannot build one-story houses in this world anymore. Uh, and uh, uh, the whole idea, so, uh, you know, like even if then I hope uh, with that idea of building little, 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 any houses all over the landscape and ruining the whole uh, planet. Yeah, and even the work we do, it's like the idea is not that you can just build a single family home. If you scale these, you can do multiple, multiple story and multiple family kind of things or row houses. So the technology is not necessarily just for a single family house. So, but that's that's a good good point. Yeah, but, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, but you should try to avoid uh, propagating it for the single family house for the individual house because there are too many of them already. And in fact, if we go, like I was, I was in uh, uh, the state of New York mm. around uh, a year ago, and I saw like out of uh, ten suburban houses, uh, mm -hmm. eight or nine were empty. What would you suggest for? Uh, 
like a sub, say there's a suburban development where everyone gets a, gets an individual house uh, there's some challenges there like like public acceptance and all that but what do you see that we basically have to educate the public to say hey hey you got to start living in cluster housing uh, so start promoting a new completely new mental model yeah yeah because uh, I mean like you know what happened in the 50s and where uh, where companies which were building, and especially uh, whiteware companies, you know, which produce washing machines, fridges, uh, you know, all those things, cars, they uh, propagated the idea of the suburb, move away from the city, because the American city was a dense uh, multicultural space, to move away from the black people, move away from uh, so called crime. I mean, there was crime, of course, but that to reverse that is going to be a huge cultural challenge but there are movements i read that uh, uh, movements all over the states which are trying to do that um of course the, the the trumpies will continue to live in suburbs or in uh, trailer parks but the point <laughs> is Change, yeah, we have to change that uh, attitude at least among a significant percentage of the population, um, uh, which, uh, which, would, which would result in a more uh, and also of without a whole lot of rotation, without a whole lot of. I and mean, when you go to the suburbs, there's now then you have the same thing in the suburbs as in the city. But you have this idea in people's heads that the suburb, suburbs are more safe. Now, when you talk about uh, environmental technologies, I don't mind our farms or First, we need farms, we need single-story buildings somewhere. Uh, but the mass of people have to be brought back into a sort of a cohesive social uh, and therefore environmental uh, way of living. Mm -hmm. And that's not the, the single-family house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some of the groups that are in the states that work on that? You're saying they're more the urbanization. You're saying there's a movement of people saying, "Hey, that's a go move back to the cities and forget the suburbs." Yes, yes. Where, where those uh, yeah, well, I can I can maybe through Leopold send you uh, links to groups of people who are doing that. Mm -hmm. And and you can read the New York Times or you read the uh, you know do you know David Byrne. Mm -hmm. He has. He got fed up of waking up every morning and reading bad news. Careful. So he has a whole list of good projects. You can look at that. You can uh, subscribe to that free reasons to be cheerful, and uh, you get a weekly uh, letter with, mm -hmm. which uh, talks about all these projects uh, all over the world, of course, but mostly in the United States. Yeah. yeah. I would like to add something quickly if it's okay. I, I, like when we were talking about density and what is the best density and what's the most environmental friendly density and this urbanization really, it's, real future is it's just happening now and we actually thought, okay, it's very hard to answer that. Because also regarding what effort does a building need to be able to stand for three stories, or six stories, and I'm going to mute. So, and it's very different to make a building for six stories or three stories in terms of material what you need to invest. And mm -hmm. timber needs a lot of additional steel if you go beyond three stories, for example. And uh, I just want to say that I think it's very important that we create buildings that can work for different, that we can reuse the building parts for different kinds of stories, uh, like the different levels of building. So we're thinking a lot about, okay, if we leave the columns away of this building and we just use the facade elements, then we can make a two or three story building and we add the module of a column uh, to gain more stories. 
just want to say that uh, also additionally to the topic of popularity. Yeah. And but I think it's a very, um, I mean you know the food, food, food organization uh, says we cannot um, uh, grow the food all citizens need in the world if we let our cities. Uh, continue to grow and we make um, mass um, agriculture as we do it now so we will um, we need more small scale food supplies and so on and therefore we need not uh, growing cities and this, I think it's a very big discussion I just want to say it's a big discussion and I don't think it's a very easy solution and I would I would just would say regarding buildings we should focus on creating building parts that can be used for different um, scenarios that we cannot predict at the moment. Mm -hmm. well, okay, uh, we, we are in the middle of our two-hour session. Uh, do, do you want to make a break or shall we continue? Continue. Okay, everybody for continue. Uh, I would also prefer continue, but also would like to, before we continue, just um, have a look what we want to focus on for the second part. Yeah, okay. Uh, ju just one, one note. Uh, uh, Ramesh, your sound quality was uh, very interrupted and very bad. But uh, it would be great if you can supply some, some links. Uh, I, I try to make a big picture about all the open source movement. Uh, on, on a Miro board. Unfortunately, it's read only for most of you, but uh, I, I shared already a, a crypto pad where everybody can uh, input uh, comments and questions, and then I, I will put it to the, to the Miro board. Yeah, the second part. Uh, I, I think we are just, just good in time. Uh, if you want to to talk more about architecture, I think we have time for it. But I, I would like uh, to talk uh, to to move to the open source business model part in in, in our second second hour. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's open to you. Nicolas, you are muted. Yeah, for, for me, it's also interest. For us, it's interesting to talk about that as well. Yes, how to keep our project sustaining and so on. Yeah, yeah you you just switch to the the right slide. Uh, it's it's just some some thoughts I have in mind. Uh, I, I'm I'm looking into this semiconductor production currently because it's it's a very hot topic and it's very political and if you look in into the evolution of the semiconductor production in the first step uh, there, there was everything in in one in one hand from design to to the final product uh, everything was made by by one company, and uh, as you can see, uh, in, in, in time, uh, it, it has been very specialized, and uh, currently there are a lot of companies which are fabless companies, so they don't have any production, and uh, there are some companies which are doing just uh, the design part and uh, I, I would like to discuss with you also with with Marcin uh, I don't know if you see the situation but uh, I can see you you have made a lot of uh, prototypes over more than a century yeah, but a there are almost no real products and it's it's very it's a it's a, as you said in your workshop it's it's very tough to to come to the the product stage. 
So I, I, I would like to discuss if it would be good, at least in the first step, uh, to think about research and uh, development. Because uh, if I look into the open source software development, a lot of uh, money uh, is coming from big proprietary companies which put uh, money into open source uh, development. And uh, they, they are working very agile, very flexible, and they, they are working different than big companies. So that's, that's just what uh, one, one thing uh, I, I have in mind. I mean, if, if we look into open source hardware production, uh, it's, it's different on electronics. Yeah? And uh, I, I think uh, that that's also one of our problems because a, a lot of people associate uh, open source hardware with electronics. And uh, we know electronics, it's <laughs> open source hardware is more than electronics. And in electronics, we have, uh, I, I think we have a good example which can compare with Linux. It's Arduino. And uh, I think it's great because it's, it's, it's a, a module you can use if you want to build any kind of uh, prototype in electronics. But uh, if, if we go to mechanics or mechatronics, we we don't have the, we we don't have arrived into this stage. Mm -hmm. I can comment on this. Okay. So go back to Linux, and Linux is, is actually a good metaphor for hardware, uh, because if you look at what happened with Linux initially, the story was if you look at Linus's initial thoughts on how he gets this into the world, he said product really fast like put all the energy behind a minimum viable product that now you can get companies funding that so what happened there like within like a year or two of him uh, sending out his email to the community saying hey i did this little thing here uh, within about a year or two i forget the exact but it was pretty quick people started funding it because he had a minimum viable system that was functional so the point is we need to get to that point ASAP as soon as possible. So for the last decade, we've been messing around with all kinds of stuff, doing a, a lot of very valuable prototyping that showed that, hey, stuff works. It's doable in a decentralized or small scale production method. There's social production models that can be used. Uh, there's collaborative development that can be tapped. But the thing personally I forgot is um, there's a thing like a product. It's, it was always project thinking, not product thinking. So that's the, our latest transition is, okay, let's be very deliberate about the enterprise aspects. Now, the, now the, the reality is, can we mute, mute that? Uh, the reality is, though, that um, while open source can be more efficient and can reduce cost by collaborative development, you still need a lot of prototypes and resources to make it happen. So if you like, look at the metaphor of Linux, how many bug fixes are there? Hundreds, thousands, millions. And literally, it's the same for hardware. Like, for example, with the printer right now, we're like right now, to me, it's becoming very clear that it's not just like one, two or three prototypes. It's that it's all those lines that the programmer changed one bug fix here, one bug, bug fix there. So you have to do that, that same thing with hardware. In other words, hardware is really expensive. It's, it's expensive to, to develop because it's not electrons, it's materials and so forth. So I, I coined a term for that. This is called the open source hardware trap. The, the, with the, I mentioned that in my other talk, the open source hardware trap is where somebody starts to develop something and because it's not one or two or three prototypes, but a dozen or a hundred or a thousand, they give up. And then the next person does it. They repeat the wheel again. So tell me how many, um, how many of the CNC circuit, uh, C, no CNC routers out there in the world? How many thousands of those projects exist? And there's not a single 
working open source CNC router. Yeah. That's comparable yeah, to the I, 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 tot so, I totally agree. Uh, I, I think we have to speed up uh, things. Okay. And uh, I agree uh, mostly on, on complex projects and hardware projects are complex. Uh, it's not enough to build one prototype. So we need uh, a lot of prototypes and uh, it's, it, it costs a lot of, of money and resources. So I think we, we can't be so wasteful as in open source software development. <laughs> I say it critically because uh, I know there are thousands of open source projects on GitHub and but there are only very few which are really mature and which are good documented and uh, with which you can use to 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 build up on it so i i think that's the the, the important thing we, we we need good documentation and uh, and and what, what what i wanted to say is i, I think we, in, in the first step, we should uh, think about uh, rapid prototyping to, to speed up things before we, we, we think about uh, uh, products, because products are, are the, the next level after, after the prototype. And uh, we, we, we are not... Uh, mo most of the product projects I know are, are not professional enough that's that's my my impression yes okay so to, to continue the, the the point i'm trying to make here is that a startup will will take 10 million dollars for from venture capitalists and do something and actually get a product out the same thing has to happen with with hardware if you try to do a replicable scalable way reliable way that simply shows okay we put in the money and then we get a product out and that's the kind of thinking behind the extreme enterprise model. We simply need to have enough people show up and enough resource show up that we get it done. Now, uh, that ra rapid prototyping, all the, all the tricks of how good documentation and collaborative development can reduce the cost significantly further. Yes, that's all there. For which reason, to me, it's inevitable that the open, co open collaborative not just open, because most open is not collaborative. So, uh, like Vivi House and OSC, we didn't collaborate on that yet. We we should, um, but um, collaboration, open source. There's certain advantages we do have over proprietary development, but upfront we need to have enough of of the resources and enough people show up to make it happen. And that's the kind of thinking we're doing right now with a house, saying, okay, a house is something everybody wants. We can leverage a lot of collaborative development around that and then make it work. But the business model cannot be a scarcity model like, oh, we're just going to try to scrape through. Like, no, you have to say we need X dollars to go through all these steps and do the proper development to make it happen. So it's not like a Kickstarter for $10,000. It's $10 million. It's a million dollars and up. And we have to th I think we have to think that way to succeed at this. Like, for example, with Vivi House what i think you have right there is precious and priceless it's billions of dollars of value once completed if that's the case same for our house billions or trillions and we're about our house it's like okay yeah we're starting with a stick frame but the compressed earth block like all the other techniques that's in there it's it's all in there but we got to start somewhere um so given that the value proposition is significant no question about it you can you can incubate and start so much enterprise once you have the product so you have to make a bold ask and say okay we need to do this and and we, we need to think really hard of how we get all the resources to make it happen so that's the kind of thinking that has to happen for for this to succeed and then you get into the tactical details for how you get there uh, i can share some of my experience if you guys want but um, but that's that I think is the start for for me from open source ecology from doing a decade of seeing how open source hardware does not work towards completing a product. Uh, that's the recognition right now that we just mimic what industry standard does, which is a bunch of capital up front, 
and I think that applies to open source, but we can do it in a completely different way. We don't have to go to the venture capitalists, we go to the stakeholders that want this, and it's a collaborative funded development effort. That's it, piece of cake. Uh, where do we go from here? Um, maybe I jump in at that point. So our background is rather an, a design background, and, and mm -hmm. but you, when you're thinking about a house, you can also think about a, a refrigerator. You know, mm -hmm. so could be the refrigerator part of one of these housing modules because mm -hmm. we always think in just products, but we can integrate them more seamlessly yeah. into a house structure. We have to think about a kind of off-grid sanitation solutions. You know, mm -hmm. we. Uh, we we were working on a on a project on on using uh, biological waste for creating biogas. You know, um, it's it's just three different um, things which you maybe the biodigester you don't need in a house, but you need a refrigerator, honestly. You know, and you need a a, a, a stove to heat things and and to really have a. a, a better understanding that the house is not just, you know, just uh, the, the outer shell, but this is a kind of combination of, of objects creating something which, which we... Yeah, absolutely. Which can... Absolutely. Uh, well, in fact, the house I'm in right now, we have a biodigester. That's part of the module that will be available in a seed home too. For, like right now, the way we're using it, we're actually not collecting gas, but we're processing our wastes so that it becomes gray water for septic fertigation. So that's like this house, for example, is off grid and we have the biodigester here. So yes, uh, anything can be like, a, like the washing machine. Yeah, I mean, that's a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar market. So start with something that has at least a billion dollar of activity around it and uh, organize a project around that. And then you have to think, okay, who are the stakeholders and how do we get them to fund this product that the promise is a better cheaper faster product that is the promise you have to be very, very clear, clear about and, and it will be, be. But, but you need that that development so you need to the the trick is how do you sell that to a public that do, does not understand what collaboration is we are not we are very much the culture is much against us in terms of collaboration that's if i think about the biggest challenge for us it's collaborative literacy people do not want to or are able to, for various, many, many reasons, work together. It's very hard. You have to have a bigger vision. It's it's not part of the culture yet. I think it will be part yeah, of the culture. Social, it's a social skill which which we miss in a, in a high degree. I can, I can give you an example. So we, we reached out to press and said, okay, we did a prototype of this refrigerator, which only comes with um, some natural materials for, for isolation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then people reached out to us and said, yes, please send us the plans. But, you know, we said, okay, this is an idea, you know, we, we just collect. Uh, this is to inspire people, but, but they just want the plans, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe a good example for what you're speaking, that, that this kind of collaboration spirit is, is missing. They, 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 they just think open source hardware is something to send a plan, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a significant cultural barrier to what we're trying to do. That's the biggest thing that I think we're on working against. I think the tools pretty much exist there. Modularity, collaborative tools. Um, but, you know, but as I say here, like, you know, for example, Vivi House and Open Source Ecology, there's definitely room for collaboration, so you should explore that. And it requires more people like that first that are open source so that's a you know that's that's a big challenge for a lot of people uh, so then you have to trick people <laughs> trick people into okay how do you get this massive collaborative development effort happening even though we don't have that culture as part of society yet so you have to be clever about okay how do we um, sell an idea that does not exist and people most people um, if you leave them to their means they don't really believe that you can do better, faster, stronger, breaking that, the so-called iron triangle. Can you really do that with open source? I mean, most people, I don't think they really believe that. 
So, so you, you have, have to do really well at selling that or educating Hello? people. Can I can I make a comment? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I I do think that um, hmm, uh, uh, maybe this is where I, as as a, as a sort of a long long term anarchist, I'm always against the state. But this is where maybe the state can step in to to. Uh, promote innovation and to take care of some of the costs. So at least for the first couple of years, the state could take care of the costs of uh, promoting these new models of uh, uh, energy saving and ecological building. And uh, and after that, companies can take over. So I think that the, the states, the state, like or the European Union or uh, European states, uh, every state spends a lot of money on innovation and sometimes just goes down the drain. Uh, my idea would be to have a kind of a, a agency which uh, specifically looks uh, a combination of, of course, experts, but other people too, to combination to look at how to uh, how to really uh, combine uh, well, how to promote, to identify and to combine technologies to make a kind of holistic uh, building, uh, uh, and in, uh, and in in further, you know, further step would be not just building but like uh, urban quarters, uh, which which are which have all these technologies and you can pick and choose, and then at some point it is. After two three years, somehow privatized, then companies can continue once they are working. Uh, the prototypes are working, and and the first projects are working. They can continue to start producing and stuff like that. But the state has a role here, apart from just uh, sending policemen to shoot people. Yeah, uh, that's a great great idea. I'll ask my buddy Trump to step in right now. But on a serious <laughs> note, no, the, that's the the challenge. There is yes, absolutely. But try to convince people to to do that. Yes, it's possible, but just culturally, like that's a hard sell. Like we've been trying to do that for ages. Uh, you, I cannot convince somebody that okay, people come on in. We we put in so much resource together. The product is going to be better, faster, stronger because it's a matter of development and capacity to product manage. Uh, mm. But unfortunately, people do not believe that yet. It's a very hard sell. Uh, but yeah. lo I would love to see that happen. And Europe is probably going to be faster than America in doing that, perhaps, because you guys are more collaborative. Uh, I can tell you, um, sorry, yeah. I can tell you it was a lot of work to get the funding for this building. And I think yeah. we were a little bit lucky as well. And it was um, a big part of uh, the project is, was just getting, finding sponsors. And, and we also... I think sometimes didn't tell the whole story uh, and the whole strategy about open source because also many people, it's not, it's not very easy to, I mean, we, we don't explain it very deeply sometimes because mm, yeah. it's very hard and, and especially in the building industry it is uh, very uncommon uh, to just think about something like that. Absolutely. Uh, also, for this, also for the state funding, we're not sure how they would act on um, on that I mean, the major funding, the major funding we got was the state funding, yes. and they are impressed. If you, when you when you said uh, open source, they are very impressed about it. But I can tell you a little bit, like our challenge with open source, it was once we uh, actually uh, like publicly talked about open source, it was big, a very big timber companies knocking at our doors because they were interested in supporting us or the project. Uh, because their products are related to it and they can sell their uh, actual uh, goods because they are used for the building. And actually, we were not aiming for the big companies, we were aiming for everyone who needs a home or needs a house uh, to, be, to become able to actually erect it themselves. And this was a big, um, let's say, surprise that suddenly was the big companies and not people who want to live in a home uh, knocking at our doors. Just wanted to tell you that 
don't know if you have a similar experience. Yeah. That's interesting, but yes, you have to work with who has the interest. So, for example, in this example, the answer in open source is it's inclusive, right? So, work with those guys, take their money, but you have the other options. And maybe you don't tell them the full story that, oh, this is actually going to be open source for everybody. I don't, I don't know. But no, you want to be transparent. Um, you definitely want to be transparent. But maybe th they still see the dollar in them in, for them. So they say, oh, okay, now we, they can use our lumber and we'll make money on it. Okay, maybe they can give you a chunk of change to develop that. Then you go to the other guy who can do it and another and another because the house is, a, is an integrated project. So that would be perhaps one strategy to go at, uh, collect the stakeholders that actually want to make it happen. Uh, yeah. For us, it's actually, um, I mean, we have a very simplistic model. You want a house, uh, collaborate in development, and you'll get a house at this low cost. So basically the direct um, incentive, like you're collaborating in a development, for us it's the fact that, oh, I will get a house. That's irresistible. That's that's a very direct uh, incentive for a person to collaborate. So for your case too, I mean, it may be, it may be that we say we we create this minimum viable product such and such, maybe without the the six-story technology, only with a three-story technology. And here's a product, and here's dollars attached to it, and here's how much budget we need to get there, and we can pre-sell it, something like that. That's exactly what we're doing. We're saying we will somewhat like pre-sell you the house but we make a very compelling story that we have it because we have done tons of constructions um you guys now with this three-story model i think that's more than enough to me it seems like that is enough to make a very compelling campaign to say okay now we're going to take this to a mi minimum viable product that people can actually buy and you have revenue. You're not depending on a state. This is actual enterprise, good old enterprise, mm -hmm. free enterprise, open source enterprise and distributive enterprise at that, meaning that part of your value proposition is to the entrepreneurs that want to build them mm -hmm. because you're, if you accept the concept of distributive enterprise, the fact that you're also opening up your business model, and then you have Which a is very necessary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's what we're yeah. doing for our package. We're actually going to charge entrepreneurs to get the training to build these things. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the revenue that mm -hmm. gets into funding this whole package to mm -hmm. the order of above a million dollars, at least. Mm -hmm. Because we still need a little bit of that much to go. So I think there's mm -hmm. definitely some clear opportunities where you can, we can think about a minimum viable product that's that you know you can do and put a little bit more development to that so so thinking more like the entrepreneur at this point than than a project manager so now getting mm -hmm. into the product uh productization part which is a completely different story than the project than just having the technology so to switch gears now okay here's enterprise here's business mm -hmm. And it's inclusive business. It's inclusive. It's it's the it's the most irresistible offer if you can if you can sell it. It's it's got incredible potential, and that's that's what we're selling. We're not just selling this house. It's it's a much bigger thing, mm. and uh, I think with just I mean what what you showed me just now the three stories that's pretty impressive. That's I think you guys can do it. We should collaborate. Yeah, we should. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I, I think uh, we should also be self-critical because uh, my, uh, my impression is that uh, collaborative literacy uh, is even not very high in our open source community. I mean, if, if I try to get information or share information in, with, with open source ecology Germany, it's it's almost impossible and uh, in other countries <laughs> i even can't can't reach anybody or get any any answer i, I send emails but get don't get any answer so uh, i i think we 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 should think about how we can improve uh the literacy uh, in in our open source community 
Well, I completely agree with you. Like, for example, just to give, give you an example of, of what, what my experience with that is, I went to the entire Oshawa directory because we were, were organizing the open source microfactory steam camps for immersion training on small scale digital fabrication. I said, okay, let's get a bunch of these open source hardware players. Clearly we can uh, collaborate yeah. to create a really, really good program. Out of the entire directory, I got one person to actually collaborate on that project, which was like, wow. Um, it was kind of surprising, um, but yeah. that's, that's the way it is. So I would definitely say that open source is largely non-collaborative. Even the model, the very basic premise is you're open source once you publish it, but, but it doesn't matter that you don't collaborate. And that's, that's the norm. Like people go off into a corner, they put it up on a website, and that's, that's called open source, but it's not collaborative. So yeah. I, I completely and, share yeah. that. Um, and that is one of the challenges to overcome here. Uh, I think it's a problem. Also, Arduino, for example, has it's open source, but those uh, you know Arduino boards, nobody actually works on them collaboratively. I think. Yeah, yeah. So there's limits, and and therefore, like, so, so what we're designing in the extreme enterprise model is we're hosting this big, huge hackathon. We prepare people. Okay, here's basics of how you collaborate, how you use wikis and FreeCAD and other open tool chains completely. And we say, okay, that's part of the game. Uh, you're paying, uh, you're going to actually pay us to train you to be collaborative and to get a collaborative product out of that. So we're reversing mm -hmm. that enterprise equation. Uh, we're creating a value out of that. And, and we have to uh, basically set up the, the framework for people to do that because people don't want to do that. They're not trained mentally to participate in that kind of context naturally. It's, it's foreign to most people. So we have to think of clever ways of how you actually get people to collaborate. But yeah. I mean, once again, I mean, the proposition in, in essence is simple as you get like you have enough eyeballs and any bug is shallow, that kind of deal. Well, uh, open source has shown that it, that right now, well, with open software, I mean, it's the norm. Everyone contributes to the common pool. They monetize it by derivatives of that, uh, that that hasn't happened in, in hardware, I think is explained by the 200 years of industrial history where everything was proprietary, whereas open source has started out open, so they, they kind of got it really quickly. But right now for us to talk to like anyone like John Deere or like construction people, engineers, n no, op not no open source. Not, not, that does not come into the equation. That's a, it's a hard thing. But it, the idea is obvious and, and I think inevitable for the long-term future of the world. But just right now, we're still in the dark ages of the, the open source hardware uh, phase. Uh, I, can, I would like to say something to you, but if it's okay. Yeah, yeah just, just one sentence. Very, very short. Uh, maybe, maybe you can stop the, the screen sharing now. And also you said you want to show some, some other slides uh, about your modules. Uh, uh, yeah. First, I would like to say something else, if it's okay. Um, I just want to say that if, because now talking too much and I, I feel, uh, let's say, the, the urge or the, 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 that it makes sense to collaborate, I just feel it, it makes sense to do it. And because Leopold, you always say, nobody makes nice documentations, you know, and I think you need collaborate, like the, the opportunity and the chance to collaborate first to be actually motivated to do the documentation, you know. I think it's very uh, important and because I agree with Martin that um, all those, that many open source projects are not collaborative and I think that's why documentation is bad very often. I well, I would go, a... go back one step, financial okay. feedback loops. Even Linus Torvalds, at, when you study the initial, his initial statement was, I need to get this to a product really quickly. I think he was really smart about it. He said, I need to get this to a minimum viable product really quickly so that the financial feedback loops come in and that will be an incentive that people are not just doing this for fun, this is actually livelihood. We need to get there like mm. ASAP. Yeah, but yeah, I agree mm. with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can show some, uh, pic so, like I have a, an older presentation and because I asked uh, Leopold, it's in German, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter, we just go. 
Musik wirklich eine interessante Welt. Es ist, no, es ist I'm going to the images, so it's in English. Tell us about your long-term vision. Start with that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good question. Mm-hmm. The long-term vision. Um, I don't have it here. On the slides. No, I just let me show, let me show you just some of the part, images because the long-term vision I will talk about. I'm just mm -hmm. going to say, show you some columns, you know, facade elements, floor panels, and some uh, 3D volume elements like that could be, for example, sanitary unit, which has a stair integrated. Mm. And mm. these are all the panels, the elements of the facade, and you can like um, use them like Lego, but you can also disassemble them as well. And Mm -hmm. Compost mm -hmm. them, for example. I don't know if you've seen those images, but this is the modularity concept. The, the first one we've changed it a little bit. We basically reduced all the small small parts because there was so much effort to create. And is I'm, that I'm just go back? To... Is that your current system? What you're doing on the, the right-hand image? More or less, yes, more or less, yes. Mm -hmm. Basically, the facade elements became a little bit bigger. To leave away the smaller parts. Wait, the blue parts? You don't have those this anymore? Is a, Do you have this the red? Is a steel node, the blue part, we have them still. They look a little bit different now. Um, and they are necessary if you go beyond three stories because uh, mm -hmm. the timber um, has, you know, the material of timber has a direction, and if you, you can only put a lot of force in one direction of the timber. You know, because parallel to the fiber is too weak to support more than three or four or five stories. And that's why we need the metal pieces so the timber beams are not getting smashed, basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the system, exactly. And, and the bigger elements, like the floor panels and the facade elements, are based on a wooden frame, and you can fill this wooden frame however you want, basically, with whatever materials you have. And, so on. Mm -hmm. That's basically um, allowing compatibility and interoperability between those different elements. So it's a lot about intersection. Let's say, actually, we could focus just on the intersection, and, and that's it. You know, and then everyone can um, build and design their own elements that are compatible with these intersections. That's a trillion-dollar idea. <laughs> I'm going to show you just some pictures of the process. We really made the like uh, concrete blocks on our own with French students who, who came to Vienna. That's the, the oh. that's the foundation we are now standing on. That's where that's uh, the, of, yeah, all these images are related to the building we are in right now. You can see the left on the left the nodes. We started with the Timber node. And now because of the many stories we needed to do the steam node. Uh, for and the foundation, explain your foundation. The foundation at the moment, because of this, uh, because all the buildings we made are temporary, temporary buildings, we just created um, blocks, basically. Mm -hmm. And on top of the blocks, all those nodes are placed. And on top of those nodes are the columns, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the table uh, node is, is just CNC milled, everything. It consists actually only of two parts, and because, yeah, just two different parts, and you can combine them to have a whole node. You and didn't use steel? Tried. You did not use steel there? No, we didn't use steel at all at the <laughs> first prototype, and, but we made it in a way that the steel parts and the wooden parts are interoperable. Mm -hmm. You can mix them. Mm -hmm. This is some images of our roof. You can see the wooden frame, and then some beams in between, and then the straw base. And all the beams you can um, disassemble again, and disassemble again, disassemble again. Mm -hmm. And what we did, you can see in the picture on the left and the right, uh, we put all those elements later, we used wheels, so we, can, we could make a, a production street. Mm -hmm. 
the game a little bit starting from. Yeah, it was um, because we tried to avoid any kinds of grains because they just they are very time consuming and not many people felt comfortable using them. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, all our elements were just vertically and then they were horizontally. Yeah. That's why all our facade, let's like say, plaster surfaces are quite nice uh, because when you work horizontally, lay people can make beautiful surfaces. Mm -hmm. Is that a university, university building where you're doing that, or is that somewhere else? We, yeah, we, we started in a university. This image, for example, on the left was a university. And then we had two more places where we rented a hall. Great. And uh, a carpet thing, and one was just a storage hall. Yeah. Because we detected that uh, building those elements in the university was quite okay, but we couldn't right with the huge truck into the university is way too huge so it was so fucking hard to bring those heavy elements it's like 1.5 tons or something mm -hmm. um, to the street for the lorry so next time we said we will do it in a, in a carpentry so we rented the space in a carpentry and did our diy workshop in the carpentry yeah, so mm -hmm. and we could sometimes ask ask those guys for help, but 95% we just did DIY within the carpentry. So, but it is much better space to work there. You can go. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what we did is, for example, we see our columns, the various, we, we just bought them actually. We uh, in uh, CNC made them ourselves. Like, and, and it was a big part of the concept um, that. Uh, those elements that are very essential for the construction, like the columns and the steel nodes, we, we made professionally, basically. Yeah. Those form the skeleton structure of the yeah. building. Yeah. And, and, all, uh, and all those parts can be, uh, seri can be pro produced serially. So it's just basically... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Seri are you using the tension, planning on using tension wires? We have, um, ten we have tension wires. The lady, you can see those braces on the building. Is it the same thing? Wait, that's you have those in your model in your prototype as well? Yes, yes, we have them. We have them also because in Austria, the building regulations say we have some of the diagonal bracing are made from wood because they are fire protected, and the steel bracing is um, mm. not working in case of fire. So you need to have a mix. And mm. the building regulations allow a mix because they assume in case of fire you don't have an earthquake at the same time. <laughs> yeah. But most likely it's it's possible that in the United States and in Canada you would be able to build more stories than six with our construction system. Mm -hmm. It's just because of the regulations in terms of fire in terms of uh, mm -hmm. soundproof from the other floors or the other flats. Mm -hmm. You need to add much more um, in weight in Austria, like um, as, uh, a lot of mass in our buildings. So. Uh, yeah, a lot of mass. So in, in Canada, for example, you have in, in Vancouver this um, student's dormitory with 20 floors. And it's, columns than we have, so. yeah, <laughs> they have also steel nodes, but uh, Sinner columns and they have uh, less strong regulations in, in a lot of uh, in a lot of fields I guess so so it depends really on the country on the regulations and on the state of the society uh, the status of the society the development where, where did you use those thin modules that you showed in the last module thing the thin modules in ones Which go back thin ones? These ones, yeah. That's the lengthening of the ceiling actually that comes in between two uh, main facades. Those we start we started with those small small ones, but we um, because they were so much effort and very costly, we kind of removed them in the later design. Yeah. I show you in the I show you in this here. You can see it on the on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because yeah, they were expensive and a lot of work. So yeah. yeah thought maybe you can make this um, intersections intersections between elements 
uh, on, on different places. You can just try out which is the best size for those elements, for transporting them, for building them, for putting them together, and where will be the intersections and how you can make the, um, the, the weather protection the best. Is it where the floor meets those elements or is it in between? I mean, we, oh, there's, there's, some, some yeah, there's some details and I mean, our system has probably cap capacity, capacity to, to put different uh, elements and develop different elements to those skeleton structures. I'm going to show you some uh, designs from students who were working with our BD house, let's say, framework. Uh. And I just show, because this, this especially this one I would like to show, it's, it's a BD house technology integrated in a BD house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If the students chose this themselves, they wanted to, to experiment with this. Well, for example, yes, they were yeah, trying out shading systems. With Arduino. With Arduino board, yes. Yeah. I was, I think I'm just looking for, what we also did is we, we worked together with companies that were sponsoring and they always were showing us their products, for example, those tools, and also were showing how to, how to um, integrate a window correctly and all of this. Mm -hmm. and so, this was, I think, a big help for us, um, having professionals showing us, okay, this is how you use this tool, this is how you use this product, and if you do it, use it like that, you won't have any problems mm -hmm. regarding water damages or something like that. And, and I just want to, like our first work, this was the image of one of our first workshops, we were drawing the details on a piece of paper mm -hmm. <laughs> and explaining how to make the buildings later. Okay, I thought there are some images coming. Okay, these are just some images. Oh no, this I wanted to show later. We really try to make a manual that's, that, that allows people to work in their own speeds, let's say, and they're not depending on us. This is just this wooden framework of a facade, and then you have a step-by-step -step, uh, documentation, basically, how to, how to make it. All the wooden okay. framework is laminated lumber? Not all of them, but yeah, this one here, you can see yes. This is something we, we, would, we are very willing to reconsider and think about. <laughs> this is because, you know, this element has a weight of one and a half tons, mm -hmm. and it needs to be able to, uh, like a crane should be able to uh, take it, and it needs to hold itself. And the structural engineers, they um, crossed laminated wood to take more loads than just normal wood. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> and also they were a little bit skeptical um, that we are DIY people, and so they, I think they made it also a bit quicker. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of room for optimis optimization. And, and, and associated with this kind of um, um, manual, we had a, an Excel sheets basically, and it was referring what kind of materials you can use for each steps. Mm -hmm. So so you use the right screws, you know, and because we we didn't have much res let's say reserves. We had really all of the materials we needed basically. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. We have some pictures from our mounting process with the professionals. Yeah. This is uh, oh this was the first prototype mounting. And I can, well, this was the first prototype. And this is mm -hmm. now the same door we have here, the red one. Mm -hmm. All of those parts have been reused. Yeah. And we, yeah. And we, learned, we learned a lot about logistics. This was, I yeah. think, the biggest, biggest yeah. learning need we had. <laughs> yeah. And it's easier to make those elements 10 to 20 centimeters uh, lower and so you can just order the average truck and not a special truck with a low trailer mm. which is more expensive for example. So and you can see on this image everything is quite on the limit. Yeah. 
Yeah. You can see the nose, the silos on the left. Yeah. Some steel parts came from Katowice. Mm. But not all of them. Yeah. I and think that's it's yeah. yeah. And from the um, Long condition. Long condition. Okay. I think the, uh, regarding long term vision, I would say we started out and we're thinking about okay, how can elaborate cities in general look like? Um, and uh, a friend and I, we made a concept, it was called City of Workshops. And the idea was how can we everything um, generated and created within the, the let's say, framework of workshops and not within the framework of jobs and professions and I think this is how actually we started this is the, the oh wow the, hold on say that again so you said you started with a question of how do we create collaborative production yes and yeah in a, in a manner that we don't think anymore about what's your job and what's your profession but rather than you have lots of opportunities to participate yeah in yeah, that's what I call freedom. Yeah, that's that's the same mental model for us. We're saying like jobs. No, it's about unjobbing. It's about pers freeing people up to pursue what's important to them. Not this jobs thing. That's man. That's a that's the the, 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 the shift a, we want to yeah, have. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's... And but in a way that we manage this shift in a manner that we still can create everything we need. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And. Mm -hmm. That's the vision, let's say, and we started because we're looking what can we contribute as architects, okay, let's start with you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully all kinds of industries and food production, energy production, things similarly that we come together and meet in the middle, in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for us, yeah, similar model for us. For us, what we're actually interested in is building campuses. Like here, we have this facility of 30 acres, but the idea is to build... Uh, OSC campuses, we call that. It's an integrated facility for living, learning, lifelong learning. It's basically like a mixture of a college campus, eco-industrial park, a farm, a business incubator. Like the that's that's the model. So cluster development. You've got all the life support systems around that, and that's a model of model cities, model settlements that spread knowledge and prosperity to their communities. Yeah. A little bit like the only commons you have. Mm, like, like Auckland. What? Auckland. Do you know like only what? commons in Auckland? No. What is that? It's it's a, ba a place uh, that yeah is a yeah it uh, offers lots of opportunities to produce things in it. <laughs> How many commons? Uh, you can Google that. They have a, a crowdfunding video. It's a very old. I think. Yeah, but they have a lot of fab lab style stuff in it, in combination with different workshop spaces and, and self teaching workshops. Yeah, it's called Omni also Commons. Also, art then hmm? Omni Commons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Leopold, shall we just continue? Uh, maybe someone else wants to say something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I I have one question to Martin. Uh, in your workshop, you are talking about the alumni extractor, mm -hmm. and I was trying to find something online, but I'm not sure. Is it uh, really alive, <laughs> or is it no, just on paper? No, it's on paper. According to our status of completion, we have about 30% of the work done at this point. Uh, we don't have prototypes on the aluminum extraction from clay yet. The idea there was to show that we can take a parcel of land and from the natural resources we can create modern civilization, which would include um, biomass, it would include metal, it would include ceramic and semiconductor. So sand to silicon and making things like PV. So that's, that's kind of the vision saying that, okay, with open advanced technology that's widely accessible, you can take widely accessible feedstocks and create modern civilizations from them. So we don't think that's a big deal. Right now, we're, we live in a world that makes it seem like that's act absolutely impossible. 
but it's not. It's uh, energetically and technologically, it's quite feasible. So we just wanted to do that in order to show proof of concept of what's possible. Um, but no, we don't have it at this point. Status of completion on our wiki is what we have so far. So yeah. So yeah. What, what what are the, the biggest problems with, with it? Oh, with the I don't. I mean, it's proven technology. You can take aluminosilicate and then turn it into alumina, aluminum oxides, and then you can use the standard uh, aluminum extraction process, electrolytic aluminum extraction. That's the Hall Harrow process. No, there's not no particular uh, issue outside of having an open source design that does that. <laughs> I mean, it's all proven technology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, finally, I have a question to all of you. Uh, it's it's <laughs> from from your workshop. The the question is, uh, what do you think would be, could be a highly interesting open source hardware project from everybody from you? House. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Rocket to the Mars. Oh, what? Rocket to the Mars. Oh, that, yeah. Well, that's naturally forthcoming. But in order to do that, we need to learn to collaborate. I don't think what Musk is doing right now will succeed without people learning to collaborate. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is special about houses and housing is it's just an intersecting field to many, so many other fields, it's so mm -hmm. easy to connect anything to it, if it's a refrigerator or what, whatever, yeah. or, but, mo or mobility. Yeah. Open source real estates would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get people to collaborate. Like, for example, the German washing machine project, it's one, once again, it's like, they're like, go away, when we finish it, you can collaborate, but right now, like, they for example, don't really collaborate with you. They're in a corner doing their thing. So can we invite them and say, hey, uh, open up the process of developing that open source washing machine? You know? Yeah, of course. After this uh, building workshops, we have a lot of things to wash. You're right. Exactly. We could use one, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like what, what is your favorite? Uh... Most interesting open source hardware project. Yeah, um, 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 I think just just summing up the, the 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 discussion for me is is really just adding some some of the the essential tools, you know, which is a washing machine, which is a this this kind of smaller scale parts of a house maybe. Um, 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 we're just wondering how, how, and I think Martian is, is totally right in this. This is really huge investments in, in, in coming up with something which can be really scaled and then built in, 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 a, in a bigger, um, in bigger numbers. And, and we, we don't have any, any, any answers to that yet. Um, I, I think what works well is to, to, to create a, a spark and, and inspire people. Uh, we have also talked about this kind of issue in, in, in creating this community culture up and running and, and, and have a co collaborative development of it. And, and yeah, I, 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 don't, would, uh, I would replace actually the spark. Nah, that's not good enough. I mean, for example, <laughs> we we did the brick press, the tractor. How many people are doing building them? Nobody. Uh, you don't need a spark. You need a business model. I think that's what it is. But I mean, in a realistic way, a, a way to meet substantial needs to generate value in a way that can be used to support people. Um, yeah, can, can, have, can have I have that kind of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what you were mentioning, this, uh, um, at, at first, you pr probably need this uh, product idea and this trillion or billion or whatever dollar idea. And a very long product development time with a with a lot of iterations, which is the, which is the bottleneck in open hardware. Yeah. Actually, being for all the for the year or two years of iteration of let's say ten to twelve uh, 
till you get to an MVP point of the washing machine, of yeah. uh, off the grid sanitation toilet, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Or be it a biodigester. Did you want to make an MVP? Um, at, at the moment, it's uh, I mean, resources and money is thinking of how, how you do it. I'm not pretty sure, but probably Vivi House, you get your resources from university mostly. You do workshops there. Uh, no. I didn't no. get any money, almost any right. money from universities. What's In, that? The university was not funding a lot and we were not... Resources, not financial, people. Ah, yes, yes. Yes, yes students, so, yes, exactly. Students people and some spaces. With some intrinsic motivation, showing up, helping, getting things done. Um, um, spinning their heads around uh, a detail, drawing in, in CAD and uh, or going to a workshop and just trying it. Not, so that's what I meant by resources. I don't know how Martin is doing it in, uh, in our field. Um, a, a, very, a very developed model has always been like uh, internships, right? Which is not a preferable one. Which is definitely not a preferable one, but there is no other... How, how do you get okay, to... Okay. So yeah, you, you need exactly that, but how do you do it? Our, our thinking on this is you have to expand the scope. You have to think about the infrastructure for it's not you and your internship guys. Make the problem big enough that you get a thousand other schools, a hundred, a thousand. The problem you're talking about is big. But it's university, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So have the mm -hmm. thing at, okay, here's a, that's what we're, for us, for example, the next thing after the house, we're looking at, okay, how about a solar car challenge for universities that actually make a viable version of the sun race, the solar car that universities already do. Select something huge and, and then create the infrastructure around it, actually an organizational effort to say, okay, here's a program. We're collaborating with all these universities to do that. So the point is, yes, you have to have those 10 or 100 prototypes. For us, that means, yes, if we want to do it fast, the only way you can do it is compress all that effort in a short time period and that's by modular design like software has shown like we have shown by modular design you can break down a project into many many parts to make have many many people work in parallel uh, the question is having the bodies show up when i review our work during our design sprints we had up to 20 people we don't need we can't do that uh, a project in a weekend or a bunch of weekends with 20 people you need like 2,000 people you need the scale of Linux. Linux has about 2,000 full-time developers right now mm -hmm. to create serious traction. Think about how we get that in, in hardware. Uh, we really have to think at that big scale. So if, But one way could be, like one thing we are trying for the house is, okay, here's an event. We're going to get like 1,000 or 2,000 people to that event. Now we have to prepare people to know how to collaborate. Put your documents there. Here's the wiki, here's some open tools. But we have to think about ways to massively convince, uh, condense that time um, as long as we don't run into Brooks. You have to manage Brooks' law, right? Brooks' law is that the more people you throw at a delayed project, the later it will get. You have to manage complexity, uh, right? But those techniques are there. Open, like product development uh, literature talks about modular design, the modular breakdown, like in Linux, that's all proven. Now we need bodies to show up. There are techniques. We need bodies to show up. So our initial thinking on extreme enterprise for the house was 2000 people, three day weekend. That's 24 hours per person. So in one weekend, we have 48,000 hours, which is 20 years of full time development by one person. That's the kind of scale you're going to have to talk about. Uh, that's an uh, undone experiment. We haven't done that yet, but we're thinking along the route. How many people can we condense into a short time period? So organizationally, it has to be doable. Management-wise, it has to be doable. But try to compress that and, and think way bigger. Don't think about just your interns. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that for 10 years and you'll get the best product. Uh, 10 years, 20 years. I mean, it's slow. It, it takes time. So, so let's just expand. Let's get more people, break it apart into more parts, do it all in parallel. That is, to me, the answer. It's an obvious, somewhat of an obvious answer. It's challenging because now the you're solving for collaboration and organization. But I think that's the way we have to think. And that's, that's the way we're kind of going right now. Does that make any sense? Or 
I think we pre pretty much like the uh, the idea of the solar car um, challenge. Yeah. A different yeah. universe. You have to say, here's the most life-changing thing. We're going to solve clean energy. We're going to solve transportation. And then we say, okay, who's not who's not going to show up for that? Well, yeah, but it's still going to be all hard. All it's still going to be hard. But but yeah, you have to start with all a... at the same time. But transportation and solar is uh, that would be a good uh, good way to start. That's yeah, that's impossible right be, now. So you have to get defined. Would have to be very defined what uh, what yeah. the target is to, to yeah. be resolved. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> but what is the thing which drives you the most to reduce the period of time of the process of constructing them. I mean, I, of course, I understand this will to do it fastly and to do it different and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, deeper, looking deeper, I would like to understand what's the driving idea uh, to this. What's, for what's you. driving I mean, personally myself? Yeah. The, speed, I mean, the, the speed, I mean, you could look to, to Asia, to China, I mean, the Chinese, the Japanese, they could manage those processes uh, maybe the best uh, when they have a crack in the street and uh, there was something in Tokyo, the whole square was collapsing, you had a huge hole mm. and all the cars were falling down and they repaired the whole square, I don't know, in 48 hours with 2,000 yeah. people. Yeah. And it was in Facebook, I don't know if it's true or not, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe those guys could do it much Are... better than we in Europe could do this. We have three workers and a huge building site for a street and it takes five or five months or one year to, to build some trucks for uh, trams, for example. Yeah. So yeah. these are the uh, um, examples which are the opposites, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what is your question? My question was, OK, wh what is the driving uh, force for you to say it's such an important topic for me to reduce to, I don't know, oh, okay. building why? a house in three days. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so you're asking why we're saying we're going to do this crazy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the motivation for that, uh, like at the fundamental level? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think... I think you're especially, especially asking about this crazy thing in, in terms of speed. And okay. Just three days, you know. Mm -hmm. um, because I can... I can envision an organizational process that gets a large number of people collaborating, but the most important outcome of that, it's done. If you can show that, you've just shown that you can create a meaningful thing, something with huge value in a short time. If you don't do that, if you spread it over a year, 10 years, 20 years, you lose interest. You have to. You have to get people to, for us, the reason for that 2000 uh, crazy idea is, yeah, I think that could happen. Uh, I think enough people will think it's crazy enough and we'll be able to participate and we will be able to manage it and we'll get a real product out of that. That's the reason. You need enough development to make it happen. So what's the alternative? Um, I'm open to some other alternative, but I could see this organizationally and practically happening. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know of another way, because if you lose, if it takes too long, people lose interest. You cannot get professionals to, say, volunteer or show up for like more than three days. So we couldn't make it like a whole week that you take off. Mm -hmm. I think a weekend, like intense, we know the method of a hackathon. We know that people do crazy things in hackathons like that. Okay, so let's extend that and now push it to the limit of what it can do. So. Does that answer the question, or it's yeah? Really, we're and, solving and for very this. interesting. Yeah, and very interesting point would else be um, where will be the differences between a normal process and your process then? Ah. Um, in terms of um, okay, okay, let's say you you shorten the time by four times or ten times, and you uh, multiply um, or I mean the people by four times or ten times. Or is there some disadvantage on no, your disadvantage? Um, well, um, like you have an exponential curve that in some fields you would be much more economically um, working than in a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Um, 
you're saying like what's if you take longer like okay would that work would be there be a model that makes it work is that no same german ähm ich meine dass ähm wenn du es einfach schneller machst dass es nicht einfach nur schneller geht mit mehr leuten in in der gleichen anzahl sondern dass ähm einfach dadurch dass du es so schnell machst es viel effizienter wird in ein einigen okay. feldern yeah. i got it I got it. So the answer to that is, I, I understand that. If you're questioning whether it's, you're going to lose the efficiency by doing it in such a short time, you think that, okay, it's, if you just give it a more natural pace, it, it will actually be more efficient, right? Is that no, what you're saying? No, no, I, 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 my question was, if it could be much more efficient, if it's in your shorter. Well, time. that's, you're questioning whether that will be efficient so that's the thing we're testing we mm. we are going with that with a into the project saying we think that mass collaborative breakdown or ta mass breakdown of tasks into small parts based on the work of linux based on where they divided a whole kernel into packages and 2000 people can work on them at the same time right and we've seen that in our work we sh we've seen that you take the tractor you break it into the engine the wheels the frame the hydraulics and other parts and you can have completely independent teams work on each along about 40 steps of each of those modules so right there i've named about 200 people right there from the start with one person per task uh, so we're theorizing based on our experience that yes this is possible you can break down a machine into parts you can break it down into further and further subparts as long as you understand the interface between parts you can do that unlimited that's called extreme manufacturing that's uh, joe w joe justice and myself we coined that term uh, look it up on wikipedia extreme manufacturing the concept that uh, in agile scrum for for hardware development you can break break things apart infinitely and if you as long as you define the interfaces everyone can work together in a coordinated way so yeah so that's so we're testing that and pushing that to the limit saying yes it is possible uh then for the actual extreme enterprise enterprise part a lot of this now goes into productization aspects so a lot of the product will be done but then you talk about all the documentation um, legal issues, financial models, like all of that. You can get different disciplines working on that in real time. So that's that's basically our premise. We're saying, yes, it's, it's theoretically possible to do that. Let's do that because the advantage is you've got this amazing event that people are even willing to pay you to participate for and it produces products. So there's an economic model behind that that says yes somehow we think that's going to work so let's try it uh, but if there's other ways like you have to really sit down and look at okay what's a financial or revenue like a business model like if you're going to do that and scale it we're, we're taking a look at it from the perspective that no this is not just like a one one-off situation this is defining a new methodology for product development that transforms the world from proprietary development to collaborative we're solving a huge question uh, and we're saying okay one way to take a stab at that question is doing this what I described the extreme uh, this extreme kind of event which uh, we're planning to do now there's probably other ways to do it maybe um, there's all kinds of all kinds of innovation on, on operational models needs to happen here we're trying this for now based on a lot of the results we have seen already, like for example, the fact that this house I'm in was built in five days with 50 people, uh, the CD go home too. So we've seen up to 50 people doing like a lot of work in a very short time, and we're just pushing the limits of that. So for example, for your system, imagine in the future getting like a, like a baseball team or a soccer field level number of people, like 10,000 people and build an entire building complex in one day. Think about stuff like that, or one one day or one week. Like, think about crazy stuff like that. It could yeah. be an extreme business model that actually works. It already works, and people already go to concerts. 
you know that there's like a 10,000 people that are willing to show up to a crazy thing. It's more like a festival. Yeah, why not create a festival for, you know, your your house building, your complex house building and things like that. I think it's socially doable. So we're trying to innovate like socially, business-wise, product-wise. Uh, but I think it's worth trying because these are interesting things and allow you to now train people to become collaborative and work together. Like this is very foreign to most people today. Okay. How much time in, for, from your experience does it take to teach the people the choreography for what they have? The to choreography do? we're aiming for this event is four hours. One hour collaborative uh, literacy, one hour free CAD. Uh, collaborative literacy means how to use a wiki, how do you make all your work transparent and understand what a thousand other people are doing. You need a tool like, like FreeCAD. Um, and the rest is like the two other hours are more like here's what the project, here's the vision of say the house or open source ecology, so inspire with a big vision. And then maybe like fourth hour for, for this big vision, how do you fit in? Try to architect that person into that process. So there would be four hours before the event that we would spend, that each person would have to spend, and we would have to manage that process. So that means getting a community manager or some product manager role here, training and onboarding all the people. So you have to consider that. But we're saying, okay, four hours, I think that's enough. And then you can, we've seen already that in rapid time you can like if you have really good instructional materials you can teach people amazing things in a very short time and during the event if there's 2000 people you can break down to very small tasks that onboarding for each small task is not the whole uh, vision of how to change the world it's a much smaller problem so that's how we yeah. think it can be done Okay. And any ideal team sizes that you have found that you found out so far? I don't know. Don't know. Um, we're trying to go for a very large number, but if you talk about, say, there's um, the house, yeah, I yeah, it depends what you're doing, right? Like, say you're de de uh, building a module, like, or designing a module from, say, it's you haven't designed it yet, you're starting to design it from scratch. Um, I would guess that if people understand. The collaborative process that's the collaborative literacy how you actually manage the entire project together uh, if you have literate people in that uh, you can work in I mean, for one module you can say have 40 people for each development step let's say the two pizza rule of amazon says like five people can work together but i think did you guys hear yeah. of the two pizza rule from amazon yeah. uh, uh, as many people uh, should work on a project as can be fed by like two pizzas. So it's like five people. Um, yeah. But that's for the co the non-collaborative framework. I think in a proprietary concept, you can only do like five people. But I think in an open source collaborative concept, I think you can have m many more people collaborate on each module, but this is all to be tested. We don't have data on yeah. that yet. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's working in open source software development. You can can break it down into groups and uh, it, it makes sense uh, anyway, if you don't work alone. Uh, in, in, in software development, you have something like pair programming to support uh, e each other and so on. So small groups, may, maybe one group can work on one module something like that i mean i would i would say uh, i would like to add the difference between like in our from our experience uh, like the amount of tools we have is basically this is the limit we have you know if you have eight electrical screwdrivers it means okay maybe eight teams or maybe four teams yeah and the way we look and, at it is that's where say the 3d open source 3d printer and open source electric motor comes in and you've got a hundred of these at very low cost so you can ha have one for every person yeah. we think like that if, what are the bottlenecks like the tools yeah we go through a lot of drills here um mm. that's why we want to design our own open source cordless drill uh, because it's oh. very much needed and so forth yeah yeah what about bottlenecks uh yeah you it's uh, if you have a uh, one module that that doesn't work what do you then one if team you, fails if you have one team that fails have 12 teams that do the same module or different iterations of that say the wall module as long as you know how the interface you can fit it into the vivi house so define interface 
have redundant teams work on it. Yeah, and I also would say, for like for example, in our case, we we started out uh, our first workshop with 40 people. Later, reduced the size to 20 people because of the amount of tools. It yeah. was just better. And also, what we we never like like said this like we never defined whose job is mm. what to do. You know, everybody could choose like a, you know like a swarm basically uh, whatever they want to do. And usually, if there's somewhere a problem, more people go there. It's very Let's say uh, self-organizing. I think in our in our case, it was my experience. And you always have people that have more experience, people that have less experience, and yeah, there is a... there is self-organizing by all means. But I think for Toyota, the model, the running model, is heavyweight product management. That means a very strong leadership yes, that yes. breaks down all the tasks uh, because you have to have. A firm level of organization in this process as well. Mm -hmm. So it's both of That's those exactly. working together. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It, it it was great and uh, yeah. I, I I hope we can continue this. Yeah, let's continue and continue to collaborate. So yeah, definitely for the Vivi House team and also for Harold. Also, we can. Um, think about ways to one to enlarge the projects to, you know, to, to become co actually collaborative. <laughs> I yeah, mean, I noticed exactly. the need. I noticed the need for collaborative about about one year ago. Like, I, I have a mentor, and he, he asked me, "So why don't you collaborate?" <laughs> I was <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, well, isn't that the essence of what I'm doing? And I really thought about what that means, and I think about it much differently right now. <laughs> So way. for the long-term vision, what's the collaboration index of your town? <laughs> so if it's 94-5%, so... Well For my done. town? You're talking the Maysville, Missouri? I, I meant your town average. Who, who's town ever? Our town, your town, I don't know. But uh, uh, for the long-term vision, and when you speak to uh, an audience, it would be good to give them feeling what we are talking about would be uh, how many percentage of your uh, work in your town uh, is made collaborate in collaboration oh yeah well how many um, materials are from renewable uh, yeah materials how many energy exactly. can you yeah how many energy can you produce yourself in your town i think those are the questions yeah, and good questions what be, be um, the interfaces or the, the the meeting points of the old industries with this collaboration world mm -hmm. is this possible or are there um yeah struggles uh, coming up i don't know mm -hmm. so, good questions i would so, say i have an immediate answer for the first question how much collaboration i would say like 0.0001 percent it's basically yeah. the same fraction as the open source hardware world has in today's economy which is it's about like a hundred million out of a hundred trillion, so so it's one millionth, <laughs> one millionth of the current economy. So it's a very low percentage right now. But it might be different soon. It oh, within a decade, yeah, world revolution. Uh, I, I'm thinking that the time scale is here. We're talking about is about a decade, yeah, uh -huh. for major transformation happening. That's my guess. Okay, so you all have uh, the link from the crypto pad. There you can put all your questions and comments. And then I put it to the big uh, picture on, on the Mario board. So, and yeah, well, thank uh, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Leopold, for initiating and watching. Uh, yeah. Yep, Leopold for initiating this. This is great. Let's continue the discussions and, and create an open source world here. Yep. Okay. Collaborative world. Open source collaborative yes, exactly. world. Okay. Take care, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank nice you. to meet you. Nice to meet great you. Great to meet you, guys. Bye.